Hello Talk Interviews. This is Corey Kerr. In this episode of Illa Talk, uh, we have a special episode. We're sitting down with Kyle Adams, icon designer extraordinaire and host of the Behind the Brand podcast on the Sean Worth's Network. How you doing? Doing great. How are you? Good. I'm great. Yeah, doing well. So, uh, so you have uh, you have kind of developed this niche of uh, of being an icon expert. Would would you talk about that for uh, for a bit? Yeah, it was kind of funny because for a long time I worked doing UI design and the thing I loved the most was icons, like social media, different places like that. All I would post were icons. <laughs> and uh, in fact, people at a job I used to have doing UI design would kind of joke with me that I constantly, like I'm always excited about the icons. And that just became something I was really, really passionate about. And I decided to take that full time and start focusing on that in late 2014. Um, so it was, it was kind of hard to explain why I got excited about icons, but uh, more recently I've, I've done some, I guess you could say soul searching for, uh, for what is my why? Like, why am I really interested in icons? And the thing I'm, I'm most excited about with icons is the fact that they bridge they bridge so many gaps in communication because you can look at an interface in let's say Chinese, for example, or in English, and they may use the exact same icons, but different languages. And so this communication that bridges these gaps and um, I, I've looked at it from, from the standpoint of being a communication. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what way to word that, but kind of like their own visual language. And that part of it just fascinates me. What is it about that communication that is something that you're drawn to? I, I think giving brands, maybe uh, people and brands a voice. So icons that achieve goals and communicate things are helping somebody achieve their goals. And if I'm helping someone achieve their goals, then their outcome is also a win for me. And if they're winning, then... I'm helping something move forward. Yeah. So that that's a big piece for me. And my wife works with special needs children. And, um, you know, this is not necessarily on the user interface side of things, but she uses these, these little icons to communicate when some of them, uh, if they have a, a breakdown at school or there's too much social interaction going on and they just, uh, there's too much, you know, they can't communicate uh, by voice or really even listen to anybody. It's just too much. And so she has these little flashcards that she'll show to her students. And I found that really, really, really inspiring and really interesting, like a different way of looking at icons and how they can help people. Uh, and so I don't know if I derailed the conversation there, but <laughs> no, I think it's I think it's awesome. I mean, I, I teach I teach in the communication department. Our main focus is is communication. How can you communicate visually? And so, yeah, I'm just eating all this up. I just I, I love it. So my my thing, um, what I'm what I'm really passionate about is um, I love I love this age of kind of the college student who is getting ready to launch the career, you know, and get out there, and they, they're still. Um, they haven't been beaten down by the world and they're not bitter and jaded yet. And, uh, and, and I try to instill them with whatever I can so that they don't get to that point. Um, but what I, what I love about that is I love kind of seeing if I can, if I can set them on a vector and head them in, in a good direction. And so I thought that maybe we could talk about, um, that as it, as it specifically relates to, um, visual communication, we can, we can, we can niche down on, on icons if we'd like, but, um, but I really like one of the things that I find that a lot of beginners will struggle with is the, uh, coming up with the idea. You know, we have, we have the symbol system in our brain. Um, and oftentimes relying on that hundred percent makes something super cliche. You know, your first idea is going to be, this is going to be very similar to everybody else's first idea. And in an icon, that might be exactly what you need, but it also could be, um, it also could be kind of a pitfall, you know? And so there's this, there's this kind of balance of 
brainstorming and uh, iteration um, and, and coming up with the initial concept and the idea. And I noticed that you have some training materials um, and you kind of you kind of touch on that and you, you talk about it on your blog as well. So so I'd, I'd like to talk about that. Feel free to interrupt me. I'm kind of long winded, but I have a I've, I've just got a couple questions. Um, I've talked about my my creative process kind of ad nauseum. Um, but what do you do? Um, or what do you recommend to those just starting out? You can answer either of those questions um, to really get down to like the core concept, the essence of what it is that you're trying to communicate. And then how do you translate that into a visual? So my, my process is, is really extensive on, and, and I'm going to speak here from a client perspective, like uh -huh. working with a client, which I, I think you can definitely bring that over into a company if that's where you decide to go. Oh yeah, cuz you still because, have a client. Right, they're they're they are the client. You know, the company you work for is the client. kyleadams.me/process actually actually has my entire process uh listed out. Everything I go through uh to get to a final result and I have that there for clients to to look at so it's worded more towards a client and and how we are going to achieve their goals. Awesome. We'll put um, we'll put that in the show notes so everybody can link to it. Yeah, so it's something interesting to to at least read over. But um, a big focus for me up front, and a big focus if you're doing design work in general, is is knowing the goals of the person you're working with. What, what are they What are they actually trying to achieve? Because when a when a business approaches you for icons, or let's say it's an app or a website, or anything they they need to achieve a goal in the end the, the only reason they're approaching you is because they have some kind of gap in their business that needs to be filled and that that encompasses working for a company as well there's something that they need to fix there's something that's going to affect the company's uh either revenue or brand perception or whatever it is and so a big piece of my process is talking to them about what we're going to solve. What, what is this project actually going to solve? W what are your needs? And often, I know there's a lot of, there's a lot of people that say, you know, there's, there's a lot of client complaining online <laughs> of, well, they, they, they said no to this or they didn't like this or they didn't enjoy my idea. And, and honestly, you know, 90% of that is, is not knowing the goals, right? It's not understanding that approaching it from a professional standpoint of this is somebody who has goals that I need to achieve and has a real tangible result that they need from this. And it's your job as the designer to find those things out and then start working on the visual communication side of that. How do I take these goals and turn them into something tangible? And if you're not doing that and you're arbitrarily creating design work that just looks nice or seems to kind of reflect what their brand's about or or their ideas about that's where you get unsatisfied clients because they don't you're not achieving the goal they need to achieve yeah yeah that's awesome so, so i don't know if that i got a little deep there but uh that's that's really the upfront part of my process and then from there it's it's sketching and iterating that over and over while also always going back to those goals. Like I'm sure on my blog and <laughs> and the audience I have probably gets tired of hearing about goals, but but they're huge, you know. They that's design takes these goals, these seemingly um I guess business type tasks and turns those into something that's beautiful and tangible and functional. Yeah. And that that process is amazing. Um that's actually a, a big part going back to earlier a little bit of why I love icon design, because you're, you're kind of bridging that gap between something more illustrative and something that's designed and has functional purpose and precision. Yeah. So that's, that's really good. I think, I think on the other side, I mean, you said, you said 90% of the problem, you know, isn't the client so much as it is. Um, you haven't, you haven't, had or done the work to have a proper understanding of what it is that their needs are, what their, what their objectives are. Um, and, and I kind of break down objectives into, you know, what is it that you're trying to communicate the message and, and to whom are you trying to communicate it? The audience, you know, and, it, and those, those two components are, are key. Um, the other thing that I find interesting is you may have solved that problem 
but your client might not be uh, visually trained and they might have some you know, stuff that is getting in the way and you can't blame them for your inability to articulate why that, why that is the solution. And so I think, I think in addition to doing that, um, it's a cop out to say, oh, the client, you know, blah, 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 and just do a bunch of client bashing. Well, if you haven't been able to convince them, um, that your idea meets their objectives, either one, it doesn't, or two, you're not really doing your job, um, you know, to kind of bring them along and educate them and teach them why it's, why it's working. Yeah, case studies are a big part. Um, part of my client process is, of course, gathering the goals up front, understanding their target audience, like you said. Uh, as far as, as my process and the way I work, I take those goals and then I go work on the design part myself. Um, I work on the sketching and the design and I come back with a final solution. But that solution uh, isn't just, here, look at this. Because that doesn't, that's not compelling, right? Like you're right. saying, it's not, it's not informative. It just says, look at this and decide if you're, decide if it looks nice for you. Um, and so, of course, they're going to be subjective. They're going to look at it and, and think whatever they want to think about it visually because you're leaving it up to their discretion. But if you come to them with a case study and say, this is, this is all the steps I went through. These are all the things I did to get to this point. And these are the ways that this final piece achieves the goals that we, we talked about in the beginning. And I, I even word their goals as they said them to me, you know, I mean, yeah, exact yeah. wording, just communicate exactly how these things achieve their goals. And, uh, if anybody, if anybody watching this wants to see some of the case studies I'm talking about, kyleadams.me slash work has, has a lot of those examples. Like I have several case studies there that go in depth on how I created either a single icon or a set of icons. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I, I think that's so huge. Um, and I, I think that is a major difference between those that are just showcasing a portfolio and those that are explaining how they are part of the solution and part of the process. And um, I've, I've gotten I've gotten jobs solely based off of uh, people that have come to my website and seen how I've done stuff. And they'll approach me and say, Hey, I like how you think. Well, the only reason that they think they know how I think is because I've shared my process of creating that and how it met those goals and about, you know, how I, how I iterated and came down to, you know, this end icon. Cause most people are, are logo or illustration or whatnot, but most people don't, most people consume and they don't think about what they consume. And so, but if you explain it to them and you say, you know, actually I did the following things because of the following reasons. And here's how I came to those conclusions then they begin thinking about it on a deeper level and they have, they have a greater connection to that. So yeah, you're, you're like, you're like singing my song. This is awesome. I love it. <laughs> um, so can we zoom in a little bit? Um, you kind of, you kind of brushed over, um, you know, sketching and, and kind of coming up with those ideas. Um, so you have your, you have your goals, you have your, your objectives, your outcomes, whatever you want to call those, um, the message that you're communicating, the audience, and then how do you, how do you translate that and problem solve for visual. I mean, you'll, you'll go in, uh, there's gotta be some sketching involved, but I mean, what are you, what are you thinking as you're doing that? Um, you know, w w what is it, what is it that takes it from this nebulous idea or objective into something that, that is a, a tangible visual that can be used in an interface? Right. Um, well, at the beginning of this process, essentially what I try to tell any client is that I want to be able to I want to be able to embody them as much as possible, right? Because if you understand them and you're able to kind of like get in their mind, so to speak, uh, you can take the skill set you have, which is being able to design, illustrate, et cetera, and start using that towards the actual design process. So uh, when I start sketching, I'm, I'm really trying to be in the mind of the client that I've taken on, right? Um, understanding what kind of like carrying their flag, so to speak, understanding what they would want. And so my sketches start off, um, th they start off very much, like I said, in the beginning, uh, trying to achieve the goals. And I, I take key words from those goals. So, um, I'm trying to think of an example off the top of my head, but, uh, one example I've used before is let's say some, there's a app for a bakery locator. 
And in their goals, they talk about uh, we mostly we mostly strive to reach bakeries that sell donuts, for example, or uh, we try to approach people in their 30s to 40s, etc. So I'll take some key words from that, like donut, for example, and I'll start sketching ideas of how to portray a donut, right? Uh, thinking of their target audience and thinking of like, what would they be interested in? And I'll do that with a bunch of key words over and over. And, and that kind of creates, um, again, I'm going to icons here because this is typically what I do, but this creates essentially a lot of little icons for different topics that were discussed in the goals. And then after that, I take those and I start mashing them together in a way that makes sense and eliminating certain things that don't necessarily make sense. Um, like for example, if they mention that, oh, our app also has a chat feature that helps people talk to each other about the bakeries they liked. I mean, that's sort of an extra feature, right? It's not a, it's not a highlight feature for them. It's just something they've included that they find interesting. So I don't necessarily need to communicate chat <laughs> in the icon, right? Um, and so I go through and kind of curate and, and get rid of some of these things uh, and eliminate down to a final concept that way. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, what do you, <clears throat> what do you do uh, when you find yourself, when you find yourself creatively stuck? Um, you, you hit a creative block. Um, I, I find a lot of the time um, I'll push hard against something. I'll research it. I'll start it. And then I just get to a point where I'm just, I'm just, I'm just drawing a blank, you know, and I kind of hit a wall. Um, and I think that's pretty common. W what do you do when you hit that wall? I love this topic. I actually, <laughs> I actually just published, published a blog post about this called how to generate creativity. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know, this is like, I guess this is kind of a potentially, uh, controversial topic in a, little, <laughs> in a sense. Um, but you know, those times when, and I'm sure, I'm sure students for sure can attest to this, those times you get down to the last minute like the last night and you need to turn in a project and, and you spend the whole night just going, going at that with all of your might. And the next day you, you come out with a final product, right? I mean, there is no, there is no saying, well, I just wasn't feeling it. Um, yeah, there's no muse, right? I, I wasn't, I wasn't feeling it last night and I couldn't get my project done. <laughs> it's, it's been three weeks. Um, and so, and so what you need to do is create, that last minute push for yourself. And, and there's plenty of times that I need to get up and walk away and come back to things. It's, it's not that you have to sit there and only focus on it for hours at a time, but create a deadline that, that far exceeds what needs to be finished and so create that scarcity for you, right? Like put yourself in more of a box where you're trying to push those constraints and like get things done really fast and get them figured out because it, your brain then removes distractions. Yeah. Like I, I think our brains really trick us into thinking that we're not creative or we're not inspired. And at the first sign of that, we go to Twitter, we go to Facebook, we go to Snapchat, we go, <laughs> you know, somewhere else. And we're, our attention's there because it's easy to go get new attention and not be, bored of this problem that we're working on or not have to push through it. We can, we can go somewhere else and put our attention there and then eventually come back to the project. But typically what that creates is, is a lack of anything being produced. Right? Yeah. And I, and I like how you say, uh, you know, to be bored in that project because there have been a ton of studies done that have shown that boredom is directly related and linked to higher creative output. And so, um, you know, being constantly stimulated and constantly entertained um, is actually the antithesis of what you want uh, when you're trying to solve a creative problem. Um, and so, yeah, so for me, I, I, I'll do the same thing. I'll, I'll create a, what I call a false deadline. Um, and I will, I will bust my butt to hit that false deadline as if it's legit. Um, but also, I, uh, I need to go into, I, I kind of say, I kind of tell everybody around me, I, I have a studio at home. I'll tell my wife, well, I'm going to go into a cave. And that just means I'm done. You know, I, I'm turning everything off. There's no outside stimulus. Um, you know, I'm going to be in this cave until I come out with something. And, uh, and that means no Twitter 
you know, no Netflix, no, no anything. Uh, sometimes I'll put some music in there, but, but they've actually done a ton of studies talking about how boredom, um, your mind hates boredom. It's like, it's a state of, it's a state of mind that is so uncomfortable for your brain that when you are not engaged, your brain waves spike and, uh, and your brain goes into hyperdrive trying to come up with something. And the neurologists have this phrase, an idle mind seeks a toy. And so, um, yeah, so I think, I think that's perfect to kind of give yourself that false deadline and then don't allow yourself to, don't allow yourself to go be entertained because you're not feeling it or, you know, it's just not happening right now or whatever. Um, you know, and if you do step away because you do need a break and you need, you need to do something, you should, you should step away with something that, um, that doesn't entertain you. Um, go on a walk, take a shower, you know, just, uh, do some free writing, free sketching, that type of thing. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. There's a great book. I don't know if you've read it. It's called deep work by Cal Newport. I've heard of it, but I haven't read it yet. It is a very good book and it's really related to this topic. So if anybody needs something to do other than create, if they need to go on a walk, listen to this book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's great. One of the, one of the key components that I love about icon design and I love about your approach to it. Um, and from what I've read and listened to you when you, when you've talked about it, um, is, is that, that simple, quick communication. Um, and I really, I really like that idea of, you know, it's not overly complex. It doesn't have to say everything there is to say about that brand. It's not an, it's not a narrative, uh, that goes on forever and gives the brand history. It is communicating something very, very concise, um, that leads to an action. Um, and I'm curious, uh, we talked about kind of the symbol system where, you know, if we all see a red octagon with a white border on the outside, we don't have to like think, okay, I'm going to read those letters. That's the word stop. I'm going to move my foot from the gas to the brake and I'm going to slowly push my, we just, we just have developed a symbol system in our mind that our foot automatically starts moving over. And it's, there's not a lot of thought to that. Um, so I'm, I'm curious on this balance and how you strike this balance between, um, you know, utilizing and leveraging this kind of um, universal symbol, you know, of, of, we all know that this means this, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, versus something being super cliche. You know, how do you, how do you kind of balance that? Right. Um, <laughs> ironically, I've actually written a blog post about this topic. Uh, we should just end this and say, everybody go to Kyle's blog. And just read everything. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I named the article "Unique versus Established Icons" because uh -huh. uh, a lot of people ask this question. You know, I want to make my icons unique, and there's so many that people use over and over. How do I get past that? Most people want to get past it. They don't want to actually use what's there. Uh, and so, what I typically say is there needs to be a case for change. There needs to be a, a really good reason to change something that's very, very established. Um, and so, for example, in the article, one thing I say is change for the sake of change isn't productive. There's kind of, there's kind of this, this shared lexicon that we have where we all agree, you know, foundationally, you know, unless you've got a super legit reason, these are things that will always communicate, you know, this or whatever. Yeah, that, I like that. When a lot of people ask that question, when they when they want to push past these already established icons, uh, you can still make them yours. Yeah. Right. You can still uh, put your own style on it and style it towards the target audience and all of these things. Even if it's something that's already been established, there's plenty of ways to convey that. Right. Um, and so the creative aspect of that is really thinking of how can I convey the same thing in a way that matches uh, again, the goals of the project and the target audience I'm trying to reach. So uh, there's still there's still a lot of creativity there, and I think there are a lot of opportunities to take risks or change things depending on the goals that are set in front of you. But established icons really have created a language all their own. Yeah, and they've been around for a long time, way way predating computers. You know, um, for for example. I can style a play button or a pause button or a stop button in an infinite number of ways, but I'm never going to make people think that a square means play. You know, the triangle facing to the right means play. You know, the two vertical uh, rectangles mean pause. 
but within that I can I can have an infinite number of um, variation in style or or execution of that but once you break that foundational thing and you try to convince people no for this app or for this website if you press the square it means play and it's like no you're 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 throwing the baby out with the bathwater I mean that's a foundational communication symbol that we've all agreed on and I mean that predated I mean that was back in VCRs and 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 probably even prior to that you know we've We've had that in our visual shared lexicon for for decades, and so it's been very well established. But yeah, I like what you say. That doesn't mean that uh, I have to make it look like everybody else's. I can still have a lot of variation in style, and and that variation in style will help me further communicate the objectives of that brand or the brand voice, you know, or the personality or whatnot. And this is this is another thing that I find uh, that beginners struggle with a little bit is kind of continuity within a set. There's, there's a set of rules um, that a designer will put to an icon set. I'm going to have this amount of roundness on my corners. Uh, my outside stroke is always going to be this big. The inside stroke is always going to be this big. I'm not going to have a stroke or I'm always going to use this color palette. So um, I want to talk about that a little bit. What is it What is it that you do? Do you consciously decide your kind of set of continuity rules within each set? Or is that something that has just become innate to you? I, I do establish it somewhat, um, and typically what I'll do is take some icons that reflect what I would call the three different potential sizes, right? <laughs> something that's really wide, something that's really tall, and something that's pretty well-rounded um, or fills the entire square of an icon. And so what I'll do first is take those and try to make those look cohesive together. And from there, I can establish where the boundaries are for width and height and, and what kind of stroke I want to use if I'm using one or um, what kind of color palette I'm using. All those things, like I can establish that with only three icons or maybe two if there's not anything that's wide. And so that's how I, I come up with the established style guides, I guess you could call it. Yeah. So you do that at the beginning before you start designing anything. You kind of set out these these three different types of icons and you fit everything into one of those three templates that you make. Right. Yeah. Any parting thoughts on uh, either creativity design or specifically an icon design that you think would be helpful for uh, those just starting out? Yeah. For, for those just starting out, I did want to mention portfolio building because uh, this is something I get asked a lot because I have these case studies, like we mentioned earlier and those are very compelling for clients or potential hires and different things like that. But typically it's perceived as being constrained to a client project. Right. But I really try to encourage people to create their own project and come up with a set of goals, a, a company, these problems, and then go try to solve those and create a case study as if you had an actual client. Yeah. Um, and of course, you could mention that those aren't a real client project if you want or, or whatever. But the point is to actually take yourself through your process yeah, and start getting familiar with that and also start conveying that to people. And uh, that's, that's a huge thing. And it gives your icons or whatever you're working on a really great story. Um, you know, I, I recently came out with some physical products. Um, kind of my first journey beyond digital. Uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, and I worked hard to put some stories behind those, right? Like, uh, some kind of deep meaning or, or purpose for why those exist and why they, um, why they matter. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, and so that's, that's a case study in itself. I know of several people who have been interested in buying products just because I had the story behind it. And if you're working on a portfolio for, either a future employer or working on your own, these kind of background stories and, and deep meaning to what your work is, is going to help people understand and engage with what you're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's huge. Um, I think that's really big. One, one, and one of the reasons, and I just, I was just talking about this today, but one of the reasons that I think that's really important is that um, as human beings, we don't, we don't have much of a genetic memory you know, uh, we animals, they, they're good to go, you know, within the first couple weeks of life, they basically know everything they need to know. They've got the genetic, 
human beings take anywhere from like 18 to 25 years to really like be able to leave mom's nest and kind of wander around and figure things out ourselves. And, uh, and what we lack in genetic memory, we, we take up in narrative and storytelling. And so, um, we know that, uh, you know, you don't wear your seatbelt because it's the law. You don't wear your seatbelt because, you know, of whatever arbitrary thing you wear your seatbelt because at one point in time, your mom told you a horrible story. You know, you wear your seatbelt because she said, I knew a guy who, you know, he didn't, wasn't wearing a seatbelt and he flew through the windshield or whatever, you know? So we tell each other these stories and we are, we are kind of geared and wired. There's a book um, by Brian McDonald um, called Invisible Ink, uh, talking about talking about storytelling, um, and that's kind of that's kind of the how. But he has another one called the Golden Theme, and the Golden Theme talks about the why. And it has all this this whole theme of how narrative is really important. And I think that's where the real power is in telling the story of your process is that we are geared towards accepting and remembering and internalizing storytelling. And so if you turn, if you just say, Hey, here's a project, um, that's not going to be as emotionally compelling as, Hey, here's a project. And let me tell you the story about it. And, and once you get that narrative of it, I think it's huge. And then, and then the other thing that you mentioned, I think is awesome. I think people should be, uh, too often we wait to be told what to do. Too often we sit here and we wait to be given permission. We wait to wait for a client to hire us. Um, but if you want to get paid to do a thing, you should do that thing for yourself. Um, and you should come up with a come up with a side project or a side hustle um, where you are, you know, you are creating something, and you 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 put it on a schedule. You put yourself on a deadline, and you treat yourself as if there was a paying client. You might be your own paying client. There's another guy, um, Jake Parker, that talks about this a lot, and he was talking to. Uh, now I'm going to forget. Is it Todd Henry or Jed Henry? Jed Henry. Um, anyway, Jed Henry and Jake Parker have this have this concept that, um, and you're following this. Instead of instead of you shouldn't have a side project. You should have a product. And if you're creating a product, there's a deliverable. There's something that you are executing. Um, then it's more than just like I'm drawing things in Photoshop or, you know, I'm playing with whatever, you know, you're actually, you're actually taking something to completion and shipping it, which is a whole different process than I'm teaching myself how to do this skill or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, so I don't know, man, you, you and I are, are in the same wavelength there. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. I mean, clients and potential hires, they don't, I think something important for everyone to remember, and we mentioned this earlier is that they don't they don't have your skill set, right? They're not That's why they're hiring you. Right, they're they're hiring you in order to fill a certain role or or have a certain skill set or you know, a client that's approaching you needs that for their business. Right. And something important to remember is that your skills aren't really going to your skills matter to them, but they're not going to be able to look at what you do and really give a good estimate or or judge of how good you are at this certain thing, right? They're, they're going to judge off of how well can I connect with how you're approaching things and what you're doing and, and the process you go through. Yeah. Uh, and you really highlighted that earlier by how people approach you and say, I really like how you think. I like how you approach things. They're not saying I like your work a lot. They're saying I like how you approach things. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And being, and being accessible and human. Cause a lot of, a lot of times, you know, you might be hired by an accountant, somebody who's totally analytical, totally left-brained, and uh, and they look at creatives as kind of these uh, flighty, you know, creatures that they don't understand or whatever. But if they see, oh, there is a process to this, and there is like some logic and some, it just lo- it just feels and it looks a little bit different. But I can relate to I can relate to a process, and I can relate to objectives being met and things like that. You have you have some more common ground with your clients um, rather than just like you know. I'm an art school major and I like to do weird stuff that nobody understands. You know, it's like, well, no, you know, you've got some common ground, especially in design and illustration as you are, um, you know, like we've been saying the whole time, you're meeting actual objectives and they do that all the time. Your clients do that every day. Um, they might not be doing that visually, but they're doing, they're setting goals and they have objectives. Those might be monetary. They might be, uh, you know, something in the, in the operations process or something like that, but they can understand that. And so if you speak the same language, then they'll see, Oh, this is just, this is just the creativity is just another part of this business process. And now I, now I can connect with this guy because he doesn't seem like a weirdo, you know? So yeah, I think that's good. Yeah. And a lot of the client 
complaining we talked about earlier. <laughs> um, that's another part of it. Like you, if you don't clearly communicate, I have a process and here's how I do things. It's left to them to try to fill the gaps, right? Yeah. Uh, so if you haven't sent your process over and let them know what you're doing and and the way you're going to function, then they're going to try to take that on themselves because they want it to turn out right. And and they want to have clear communication. So that's why they'll do things like send an image and say, can we do something like this or right? Right. You include this. And they're just trying to be, they're they're trying to participate. Yeah. And try to participate. Um, That's a great way of putting it. And so, yeah. So keep that in mind and, and know that having these things in place not only gives yourself a lot of clarity, but it also gives potential clients and even future hires a really good clarity of how you work and what you do. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And I, I, I'm a strong believer that if any time there's a breakdown in the relationship, it's because you haven't managed expectations well. Um, you know, if I set out at the beginning, um, you know, here are my milestones in my process. Um, before we reach each one of these milestones, you have up to three iterations. Um, you know, you don't have to use all of those three, but when we get to that milestone and you sign off it, sign off on it, um, I'm going to move on and that's going to cost me time and money. Um, I'm perfectly happy to go back over that wall and, and, and redo something. But at that point in time, I'll just, you know, and I'll let you know, I'll give you a change order. It'll cost you a little bit of money. So just know that, you know, this decision that you make is serious, um, because it's costing, it's costing me time. And, uh, and so that's how it goes. And I'd get a little map or whatever. So I've managed their expectations. So I have clients come to me all the time and say, Hey, um, I want to change this. I know I've already changed something. You know, how many, how many iterations am I at? And you'll say, well, yeah, this is, this is a, this is, would be kind of your second. So you've got one more and you know, whatnot. And so you kind of, and everybody does that a little bit differently. There's not like a set way to do that. But if I just come out of the blue and I say, oh man, this client just keeps changing things, but I've never told them in the beginning, um, you know, and I just whine about them behind their back. Uh, I haven't managed that relationship well. It's not their fault that they don't know my process. It's my fault for not managing the expectation of how this is going to go. So, yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's interesting to approach design where you are the professional that carries on this task. Yeah. The one that knows how to do it. So Kyle, where can, uh, give you, give you a chance to plug here. Where can we, where can we find your stuff? What would you like, uh, listeners to do, uh, now that they know you a little bit? Well, you can find the blog and all these things we talked about at kyleadams.me. Uh, I also have another site set up called learniconedesign.com, And there's a free handbook there that, uh, goes over a lot of the principles of icon design and even these goal setting things we talked about and also some recipes for icons kind of getting uh getting people used to using shapes and creating icons and um it's been a good resource for a lot of people and i think it'll really help people that are uh, you know finishing up college and, and going through the learning process yeah that's great um and you can find my stuff at coreykerr.com Um, and if you are interested in following along, you can go to and click on the contact there and you'll see all my social media there. Um, I will be releasing, and I think Kyle, you're doing something similar. I will be releasing in the near future. Kyle already has, um, a set of stickers that, uh, that I'm going to be doing through a Patreon, um, situation. And so if you want to get kind of a, a monthly, uh, shipment of stickers, then go ahead and go ahead and sign up to coreykerr.com slash email. And, uh, and I'll, I'll notify you when I, when I begin launching that. I've, and if you want to watch me do that, um, I'm on Snapchat and uh, Twitter and Instagram, and I'm sharing kind of my process as I do that. Hello Talk Interviews.